Good morning. So we are in the middle of a sermon series right now where we are exploring biblical character. We're looking at different characters in the Bible to see what they can teach us about what kind of character we're called to have as followers of Christ. A couple weeks ago, Paul talked to us about a couple of young multicultural millennials named Timothy and Ruth. Timothy had a Greek father and a Jewish mother, and he spent his life navigating between different cultural and religious expectations. Ruth was a Moabite. She wasn't an Israelite, but she decided to go with her mother-in-law to the land of Judah, a foreign country, and to cross both political and social boundaries. And then last week, we learned about another character in the Bible. Does anyone remember who we learned about last week? He had long hair, was very strong. Samson, right? Yep, we learned about Samson, that strong, mighty warrior whose character was complicated at best. He used a lot of his strength for violence and destruction until the very end, yet we still remember him often as a hero in the Bible. Today we're going to take a new look at an old story, the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the story of Eve and Adam. Now, most of, us, most of us have heard this story about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's a popular story that's found in most children's Bibles. It's one that a lot of us learn in Sunday school. Um, so how does the children's version of the story go? What do you remember about Adam and Eve? Yes. There was an apple. Yep. Everyone remember the apple? Okay. Anyone else? What else do you remember? Eve tempted Adam. Yep, that's another part that's lifted up in a lot of the stories. Yep, Eve was created as a helper from his rib. And there was one in the back that I couldn't hear. The snake. There was a talking snake. Yeah, that's memorable. Absolutely. Um, so this story, right, it goes like this. God created the human being out of the dust and breathed the breath of life into him. The human being came to life. And the man was there, uh, but he was very lonely. He needed a helper. So God uh, brings him all these animals and says, does this one work? Does this one work? And God's, or Adam says, no, I'm still kind of lonely. I still need some help. So God decides to put Adam to sleep. He pulls out his rib. He creates a woman as the helper, and Adam is no longer lonely. And they live happily ever after until who comes on the scene? Which character again? The snake, always the snake. The snake comes back and talks to Eve and tricks her into eating the apple. And then does Eve just keep that apple to herself? No, she goes and then she gives it to her husband. She tricks him into eating it. They suddenly realize that they are naked and they hide from God. God comes and curses all of them and says, you no longer get to live in this garden, which we all often refer to as paradise. And so the world continues. Do you guys remember that story? Sound familiar? Um, so this is a nice story, kind of, but this isn't really the whole story. It's actually not the biblical story. It's not what the Bible says. This is a story that we tell that has a lot of edits and additional commentary and added meanings and errors put into it. And this matters because it's had, this story has had a huge impact on women and men. It's influenced men and women's roles in the world, not just way back when, thousands of years ago, but continuing to today. This story has shaped theology and views on marriage and relationships. Um, it continues to do so in our world. Now, in the second century, young Christian women were told not to take pride in their bodies or to flaunt their beauty. Tertullian, who was a prominent theologian at the time, wrote this. He said, to these young Christian women, do you not know that you are each an Eve? You are the devil's gateway. You are the unsealer of that forbidden fruit. You destroyed so easily God's image, man. Ouch. <laughs> Yikes. Now it's funny, but the idea that women's beauty and bodies causes men to sin or to commit uh, crimes like sexual harassment or assault continues to be part of our reality today. Similarly, the author of 1 Timothy writes this. He says, I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. 
and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. This idea of women as the second and lesser sex is still part of our world today. A recent New York Times article looked at the presence of women in key leadership positions in government and business and entertainment, and it found that there are about the same number of female CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, all the women together, as just uh, CEOs named John. So there are the same number of women as just men named John. Now, if you think that's bad, there are more men named James than all the women together. <laughs> so, think about that. Women are 50% of the population. Women today earn more college degrees than men. But when the Times looked at why there was this disparity, why women were so underrepresented, they said there are a couple of different factors that are involved, but by far the greatest factor was gender discrimination. The story of Adam and Eve, or rather the version we often tell, is important because it's done a lot of harm, especially to women, not just way back when, but today in the church and in the world. Now, some people, including many feminists, have said that the Bible is a text of terror, that we just need to throw it out because it has done so much hard to women and to LGBTQ folks and to people of color. And this is a really important critique. The scripture matters. But I believe for us as Christians, we need to not throw this scripture out, but really to double down and to dig into the text to hear how God is still speaking to us today. So I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles as we read through and unpack this story to hear the story of Eve and Adam and to be reintroduced to these characters. Our scripture begins in Genesis chapter 2, which is right in the beginning of the Bible. Now, Genesis 2 to 3 is the second account of creation in the Bible, and it's an origin story with mythical qualities. It seeks to explain where we came from and why the world is the way that it is. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a couple of key passages from this story. Now, the story begins in Genesis chapter 2, verses 4, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of a summary of these first beginning chapters. This story begins with how the world was created. God creates the heavens and the earth, and God takes fertile topsoil and uses it like clay to mold the first human being. And what was the first human being's name? Say it with confidence, people. Yeah, what was it? Adam, right? So the name Adam comes from the Hebrew word Adam, which means man or human being. And the first human being is created from the topsoil. In Hebrew, the word for topsoil or this dust is Adama. So Adam was created from the Adama. It shows this, inter or this primary connection between the earth and humanity. And the story goes that God breathed the breath of life into this man's nostrils, into the human being, and the human being comes to life. God plants a garden and puts the human being in the middle of it, and there are lots and lots of trees and vegetation but there are two trees that are specifically named, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So we're going to move ahead to Genesis chapter 2, verses 15. And I'm going to be reading from the Common English Bible. It's actually up here on the screen. And I'm going to invite you to read along with me. So let us hear what God is saying. So the Lord God took the human and settled him in the Garden of Eden to farm it and to take care of it. The Lord God commanded the human, eat your fill from all of the garden's trees, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because on the day you eat from it, you will die. So Adam is in the Garden of Eden, and what does God tell Adam that he can do? What can Adam do? He can till and care for the earth, absolutely. What else can he do? What? He can eat, yep. What does God tell Adam that he cannot do? What's the one thing Adam can't do? Yep, eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, is Eve here at this time? Has Eve been created yet? No, so she's not there to hear this. And God says, if you eat from this tree, what's going to happen? You're going to die. You're going to die, yep. And so uh, that was verse 17, so continuing in verse 18. Um, you can read along in your Bibles, or else it's going to be up here on the screen. 
uh, the story continues, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. And it goes on to say that God creates different animals and brings them to Adam. And Adam says, none of these are a good fit. Um, but then the scripture says, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God put the human into a deep and heavy sleep and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh over it. With the rib taken from the human, the Lord God fashioned a woman and brought her to the human being. And the text goes on to say the two of them were naked, the man and his wife, but they weren't embarrassed. So God sees that it is not good for us as humans to be alone, and God sits out to make a helper, someone who is suitable for Adam so that he will no longer be living in isolation. God creates wild animals and birds and beasts, but none of them seem to work. Now, the word helper has a lot of baggage today. A helper is seen as less than or a sidekick, someone who's a supporting role or as or is not as important. But in Hebrew, the word that is translated as helper has a different meaning. The Hebrew word for helper is azer. And when it's used, it actually usually refers to God, to God's strength and help. The help is not a weaker help, but rather the source of all help and power. Now, when God looked for a helper for the man, God didn't know what the right answer would be. It's a process of trial and error. God creates the animals and the fish and the birds, and they're not enough. And yet God's strength is too much. The man is still lonely. So whereas the animals are below and God's strength is above, the woman is a perfect match, an equal companion and partner. Now, the emphasis here is not on sexual orientation. We know that different sexual orientations are a gift that speaks to the diversity of God and the goodness of God. The point here is that both uh, woman and man are made equally in God's image, that woman was made by God just as man was. In 1972, uh, Phyllis Tribble, who's an Old Testament scholar, wrote an article on this passage and it turned the world of biblical scholarship upside down. She argued this in her paper. She said, uh, she argued that the woman in this story, the one who was created second, was not an afterthought, but was rather the culmination of creation. That woman was not the lesser sex because she was created second, but that the woman in this story was the culmination of all creation. Now, you may or may not agree with this interpretation, but take a second to think about what that meant, what this means. What had been taught for thousands of years about men's superiority and women's inferior, inferiority, both in the church and in the culture. When you think about First Peter, which says, I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent, for Adam was formed first then Eve. What Tribble wrote is pretty radical. When she spent time with the text and dug into the details, she found that perhaps there was a different story here than what had always been told. Perhaps the story could be read another way. The story in Genesis continues in chapter 3. Adam and Eve are living together in the garden, and that snake, that famous snake, enters the scene. At the beginning of chapter 3, the snake asked the woman if God really said that she shouldn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the woman responds to the snake saying, God said, don't eat from it and don't touch it or you will die. Have any of you ever played a game of telephone? You know, the game where someone has a message and they repeat it to the next person, the next person, the next person. How often when you play that game is the first original message the same as at the end? Never, right? Almost never, right? I can't help but wonder if something similar happened here. Because what was the commandment that God gave to Adam? What did he say would happen if he ate of the fruit? That he'd die. But Eve has a different message. She says, I've been told that if I touch it or eat it, then I'll die. She says something different. 
uh, which is a little bit interesting, and we don't really know how she ever learned about the commandment from God. I assume Adam told her, but the text doesn't really say. Our story continues. We're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. I invite you to read along on your Bibles or to follow up here on the screen. So the snake is there. He's asked the woman. She said, if I touch it or if I eat of this fruit, I'm going to die. And the snake says to the woman, and the snake said to the woman, you won't die. God knows that on the day you eat from it, you will see clearly, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was beautiful, with delicious food, and that the tree would provide wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it, and also gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then they both saw clearly and knew that they were naked. So this fruit that is on the tree would provide wisdom. It's beautiful and it offers the ability to see the world clearly. Eve takes a risk. She reaches out. She's willing to step outside of her comfort zone in order to gain wisdom, to, bu- to push the boundaries of the world in which she knows. After Adam and eat, Eve eat of the fruit, they don't die immediately as God said they would. The snake was right. They find wisdom, not immediate death. Their eyes are opened and they start to see clearly. They gain this wisdom which is both good and hard. With this wisdom, everything changes. I have to admit, when I think of this story in my mind, I always thought that Eve acted alone. Anyone else out there? Yeah? In my mind, it was Eve talking to the serpent and then taking the fruit and then going back to her husband. How was he to know where it had come from? This isn't what the Bible says. Adam is right by her side the whole time. Adam is next to her, watching her reach out and take the fruit from the tree, watching her eat it and then hand it to him. She offers him the fruit, and he chooses to eat it. After this part of the story, God comes looking for them, and Adam and Eve are hiding. They realize they're naked, and Adam speaks for the first time in the story. When God says, why are you hiding? Have you eaten from this fruit? Uh, he tells God that he's, been af- he's afraid because he knows he's naked. And then he goes on to say this. Rather than saying, yes, God, I've done this. I chose to eat of the fruit that Eve gave me. He responds by blaming God and his wife. He says, the woman you gave me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. There's a lot of blame going around, but it doesn't end there. The blame game continues. God then questions the woman, and she says, the snake did it. The snake told me to eat it. God curses the snake in the fertile ground, but God actually doesn't curse the man and the woman. Remember that this is an origin story that's meant to explain why the world is the way it is, uh, why things happen the way they do. It says that for men, their work will be difficult and that uh, Adam will return to the soil, to the dust from which he came. The story ends with God making clothing for both the man and the woman and sending them out of the Garden of Eden so that they won't be able to eat from the tree of life and gain immortality. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. So what does this story, this biblical text, have to tell us about character? What does it have to tell us about the ways that we characterize both women and men? Throughout this story, Eve is assertive and ambitious, curious and willing to take risks. She is the one who talks to the snake, who reaches for the fruit, who dares to enter the unknown. Susan Nittich describes Eve as, quote, the curious one, the seeker of knowledge, the tester of limits. She's assertive, curious, and a leader. And yet when we think of Eve, what are the things that we associate with her? What are the characteristics that we assign to her? When we tell this story, how do we describe her actions and her character? For centuries, Eve has been characterized as both clever and lacking intelligence secondary and sinful, a temptress who caused not only men but all of humanity to quote-unquote fall. 
this isn't what the scripture says about eat. So why for so long have we in the church stuck to categorizing her this way? Why have her characteristics been considered character flaws rather than strengths? As I mentioned earlier, this New York Times article looked at why there was a lack of representation of women in key leadership positions in government and entertainment and business. And the authors uh, said there were a couple of different reasons. Uh, one was that men tend to mentor other men, often men that look like them, often other white men. Another reason that women kind of lagged behind or were underrepresented was that they often take time off to raise their kids or to care for their family. But the authors stated this, they said, women also face double standards. People in power need to be assertive and ambitious, but women are often criticized for acting that way. Eve faces a double standard. She's punished for being curious and seeking wisdom, for testing limits and stepping outside of her comfort zone, these attributes that are innately human and often praised when they're practiced by men. So we've talked about Eve, but what about Adam? What is his character? Adam is present throughout this story, but he's mostly passive. He doesn't actually talk or say anything until the very last scene where he offers some blame. He doesn't say anything when Eve is talking to the snake or when she reaches for the fruit or when she eats it or offers it to him. He doesn't question. He doesn't seek to really leave his comfort zone or to move beyond what he knows. Yet when we in the church often talk about Adam, we often give him a pass. There's no judgment of his silence or passivity. He isn't held responsible for choosing to eat the fruit or for not intervening. It's usually Eve who's held accountable both for her actions and for his. The Bible is a lot better at holding tension and ambiguity than we are. Throughout the Bible, biblical characters are rarely all good or all bad, much like ourselves. There are a lot of gaps and nuances in the text. There are a lot of unresolved conflicts in the Bible. Often more questions are raised than answers are given. Rather than wrapping up stories and putting a bow on them and handing them over to us, the Bible unwraps the difficult realities of what it means to be human, to live in community, to deal with joy and death and heartache and betrayal. Scripture invites us to enter into these stories and to try to make sense of them, to use them as a key to unlock wisdom about our own lives and how we are called to live in the world. When, Ab, when Adam and Eve eat of the fruit of the knowledge of, or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, everything changes in that moment. Their eyes are opened and they begin to see clearly. They see life in all of its fullness, with all of its beauty and all of its brokenness. This wisdom is not easy. We gain wisdom through lessons, often hard ones. With wisdom, life gets fuller and harder. It's about seeing the world and seeing ourselves more clearly. Wisdom involves courage because it means leaving behind what we know. It involves crossing both boundaries and barriers. I wonder what it was that Eve was hungering for. What was it that she was reaching for that day? I wonder what made her decide that wisdom was worth the risk. I wonder where her courage came from, her willingness to question, to see if there was more to life than what she had been told there was. It's interesting that Eve isn't named until the very end of this story. She's not named until after she actually takes the fruit and gains wisdom. The man calls her Eve, which in Hebrew sounds like the word to live. She's called Eve because she is the mother of everyone who lives. Jan Richardson, who is a Christian poet and artist, writes that when we reach beyond our boundaries, the boundaries that have been sent by us, we're not brought into celebration, but often sent into exile. Because this involves leaving behind our innocence and our certainty, it takes courage for us to leave behind what we've always known. Richardson writes, quote, we cannot stretch beyond ourselves and yet cling to what we have known. 
reaching means abandoning the familiar landscape in which we live our lives. Once undertaking, it is a leaving that we cannot undo or unlearn. The road by which we set out is never quite the same one by which we will return. This is perhaps the curse of each quest, but also its gift. With every departure, there's a new world. And each time we cross a threshold or make a choice for something new, every time we reach for a piece of knowing to make it our own, there is the presence of Eve in the shadow, reaching, tasting, beyond. Friends, may it be so with us. Amen.